guys, we're going to get started. So just first, thank you for coming to our first Graduate PT Club event, uh, Speech is Net. That was pretty exciting. Great turnout. Um, and we have a great program here tonight. And we're going to have Don come up and talk a little bit about and introduce our speaker. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to introduce Lou Passarello. And Lou is a certified process and orthotist, and he's a clinic manager at Hangar uh, in off of State Street in uh, North Haven. And uh, we've been very fortunate. We've got a, a great working relationship with Hangar, um, and some of his staff have come and done lectures with us. Uh, so it's it's uh, I really want to appreciate you coming and speaking with us. Um, Hangar, if you're not familiar with the company, it's uh, Hangar treats over 650,000 patients a year. They have 600 facilities across the United States, and, and Hanger actually employs 20% of process and orthodox in the country. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful company, and they're involved internationally. They do work in Haiti. Uh, I want to personally thank Lou also. His, um, his clinic in North Haven provided me with a, a, about a $12,000 prosthesis to bring to Guatemala um, on my last trip to provide a, a, to a patient down in Guatemala. So. Um, do a lot of great work. So it's good to see so many of you here. I see third year students, fifth year students, six year students. I see nursing <laughs> faculty. I see a budding prosthetist, orthotist from University of Hartford uh, graduating this year. And so the whole idea of today and what Danielle put together for you is, a, is an interprofessional education program on prosthetics because we, we I, I think we all need to know about what prosthetics and orthotics are all about. And we tend to be so siloed in what we do. And I think it's one of the beauties of what's happening with Quinnipiac right now is this interprofessional education that we're, that we're kind of in the infancy of doing. But here's a, here's a perfect example of, of getting it together so that we can continue to do interprofessional education because that's how healthcare has to work. So, um, Lou, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the relationship you have with Quinnipiac. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, guys, thanks for coming. Uh, like man said, Lou Passarello, I'm actually a graduate of Quinnipiac class of 97, home of the Braves, not the Bobcats, <laughs> <laughs> much less politically correct, correct time. Matter of fact, um, when I was here, there was a big to do from the local uh, tribal folks about the whole Braves thing, as it seems to come up every couple of years, and finally the, the school actually asked to change it. But I remember the year we were there, President Leahy did this whole big thing about how we're going to be so much more sensitive, and he invited people to come to this new unveiling of what was then our state of the art basketball center, which is, you know, the old gym down the old campus, and uh, they made a big deal about how they redid the painting of the mascot to be more politically sensitive. So the home of the Braves featured a big, giant, red-skinned man with a giant headdress, and when they dropped the flag, everyone... <laughs> so, home of the Braves. Um, I went on to uh, do my own P training at, at the time, was UConn, uh, back in the day. It was a bachelor's degree program, you kind of worked just prosthetist. Uh, or if you already had a bachelor's degree like I did, you got a post baccalaureate certificate in both disciplines, O and P. I uh, went on to do my residencies. First year was at the Hospital for Special Care in New Britain. Second year was at LM Hospital out in New London. Um, the requirements as it stands now to become an orthodox prosthetist, as Jess will attest, is there's a if you come in ice cold first year, five year program, you get your master's. Otherwise, if you have a bachelor's, it's another two years to get your master's. Regardless of which track you take, two years to do a residency, and that's another two years to take all six, count them six parts of the board exam. So there's a lot to this because there's a lot to the field. It's unique in the idea in the sense that you have to have a clinical knowledge, you have to have an engineering base, and you also have to have a material science base. You've got to know why carbon fiber is better than nylon glass. You've got to know why the foot angle is important to the, to the shin angle. You gotta know what that angle and those forces in the socket are gonna to do to the tissues of the person you're dealing with, because are they diabetic, are they dysvascular? There's a, a whole, whole lot that goes into it. I wanna apologize ahead of time, I've been nursing a head cold all week, so if I stuff up, choke on something, it's okay. <laughs> make it, it's just gonna be gross to start, but we'll get through it. All right, so I'm gonna pump for, for my program here. I meant to pull it up before, but I'm too busy. Chit chat. 
Any freshmen here tonight? Don't have to get dumbed down too much for me, guys. So what I'm hoping to do here is through some slides up on the screen here, just kind of give some really broad strokes of what OMP is. Uh, maybe put a couple thoughts in your head that you might not have before. Or if you've got some seeds and some questions in there, to have the opportunity to bring up. I'm not going to sit here and talk at you too long because I know you do classes all day. So hopefully we can have a nice discussion about stuff. Because really, there's two things to this. One is knowing what OMP is, and then two is knowing what it means for you guys. So to kind of tail off what you said before, the team approach is what it's all about in healthcare right now. There's been a movement over the last decade for things to become more and more and more and more specialized. We see it in all our fields. You want to become a pediatric physical therapist. You want to specialize in this or that and the other thing. And the truth is, that sort of siloing creates all kinds of communication issues between the disciplines. But we're in a society and in a social state now, when it comes to healthcare, that everybody needs to be talking because the constraints of insurance carriers really make it difficult for us to fumble around and take our time to do stuff. We've got to work cohesively, and everybody's got to know what's going on. Because ultimately, everything we do, whatever discipline we're in, it's all about taking care of somebody. It's important to never lose sight of that fact because you can get buried in your books, nose to the grindstone, wondering why I'm beating myself, why do I gotta memorize this thing, why is this, I, that wasn't even on the damn syllabus, why is it on the test? Because ultimately, the decisions you make have an effect on a person. You can hurt somebody as easily as you can help somebody. And when we come with a team approach, everybody gets involved so we can get the best possible outcome. So think about that, no matter what class you're in, no matter what I say tonight, because ultimately, we've got to do the right thing for the person. And I think we're losing a little bit of that in healthcare today. So, prosthetics and orthotics are two big categories. A couple smaller things can fall underneath it. Pet orthics, specializing in mainly the feet. Um, but ultimately, we'll talk about braces and legs. The orthotics, eh, kind of the ugly stepsister. Everybody's into the prosthetics. That's the fun stuff. So, we'll get to both. With orthotics, the main goal here is to provide some sort of support for the body. We're going to do something to augment existing anatomy for whatever reason. Could be a person has diabetes, they've developed a neuropathy, their anterior musculature in their shin isn't working so good anymore, they're dragging their foot, they're going to trip, hurt themselves. Let's make a brace to help that. It could be really complex, like a young child who's had spina bifida. And now they've got what is the effect of the spinal cord injury, where they, they have limited function from the waist down. We want them every opportunity to stand up from a physical therapy standpoint, to be able to bear weight through those long bones, keep those muscles and joints moving as, as much as possible. From an OT standpoint, to be able to engage their environment for an upright position. To do everything sitting down all the time is no good. You want to be up. You want to be able to do stuff independently. Really important for a small child whose independence bears heavily on their parents anyway, let alone if they're stuck in a chair. It can be real, real complex stuff. Prosthetics, like I said, that's the fun one. That's the replacing the missing limbs. That's that's the, the simple stuff from a toe filler. Send that around. Person who's lost their toes. You've got to put something in the shoe to take up that space. Can't just have them slop around in there. So the high end stuff, like you see these athletes, uh, the now, I don't know if he's been convicted yet, Oscar Pistorius, is he in jail? I don't know. <laughs> these kind of guys, to folks in our area who are golfers, who or, or skiers and that sort of thing, where we're using real high-end technology for those folks. So like I said, everything from the feet, upper extremity, here's a fella, um, there's a company in Texas that makes one-off custom devices depending on what sport you're into. So here's a fella who's uh, had an uh, upper extremity amputation, so he's got this custom device to help him swing the club with two hands. We treat pediatrics. A lot of what we do is cranial remolding. So for folks, folks, for kids that have plagiocephaly, big, big thing ever since the Back to Sleep program started in the 90s, um, where we're trying to reshape passively the children's heads. So all kinds of gait anomalies. I can't tell you, and you guys probably do the same thing now too, how impossible it is to be in public and not watch people walk. You just can't do it. It used to drive my wife nuts. 
Because when you're sitting at the table, you're watching that guy walk, aren't you? I'm like, I can't help it. You're just you're figuring out all the time. What's wrong? What's the angle? Why is it this? And then based on what you see, how do you make it better? When it comes to orthotics, well, that's tough. Because biomechanically, you could look at a problem and say, that's how I'm going to fix it. But there's still a person that's got to be in the thing. they got to be able to wear it. Um, and that can be tough. There's a lot of forces involved. You guys have a gate lab here, right? You get to see all that stuff. You see all the kinematics and everything involved with that. Boy, oh boy, those lever arms, that's some serious business. Put that on a diabetic patient, do it wrong, and see how long before their skin blows open. And you turn them into an amputee. Real important stuff. Like I said, the kids. When it comes to prosthetics, we're taking it right from surgery to the end of their life. I think prosthetics especially, and orthotics too, but prosthetics especially, is unique in the length of the relationship you form with your patients. Because I've been in the business 15 years now, I got people I've been seeing for 15 years. You guys are probably not gonna know that. If you are, boy, they're in really bad shape, those folks. Um, but it, it, it's a unique field for us because we, we form these relationships, and it's a very intimate relationship. Um, limb loss is a really difficult thing to deal with, especially when you don't know it's coming. You wake up without a foot or a leg or whatever. So we like to start as early as possible. Um, it's a very regional thing. In New England, the vascular surgeons do most of the amputations. They don't even like to get us involved until the sutures, the sutures, the sutures, the sutures come out, versus, say, the Midwest, like Ohio where the prosthetist is in the room during the amputation and has some input, and even the length of the amputation, depending on what componentry, was discussed ahead of time. Very, very regional, because out there, the orthopedists do the surgeries. Recovery, it's where you come in. Um, the sooner the better. Gotta get people up, gotta get them moving. It's healthier, we've learned that over the years. I remember when I first got into OMP, and I started seeing patients back in the late 90s, um, the people would be in the hospital for 10, 12 days. You're only in the hospital that long if something's really wrong these days. You're out of there. You have to go have a back surgery. You're lucky if you get the sheets warm before they throw you out. All right? Things are much faster these days. Then we get to the fun high-end stuff, the competition, the running, and the swimming, and the, the bicycling, and, and all the neat stuff that some of our higher-end folks do. All right, so kind of hit on a little bit, but what are we looking at? We're looking at all this stuff. OMP has become very, very complex in the last couple of years especially. The move has gone from traditional rigid feet, rigid sockets, rigid, 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 to all these flexible components, to microprocessors, to neuroprostheses, to all this really high-end stuff, where we're integrating uh, computer technology and electronics into almost everything we do these days. Whereas in the past, it was kind of like a Trust me, you're catching on to the dictionary or something. Here you guys. Um, causes, limb loss, things to consider. Medical, these days, diabetes, number one. Hands down, far and away, diabetic population is 80% of what we do. Why? Well, it's the nature of the beast. Natural history says they're going to get worse over time, especially if they don't take care of themselves. Usually the reason they got diabetes in the first place is because they don't take care of themselves. And it's created this massive population that's only getting bigger. Cancer and infection, definitely two of the big ones. You talk about your osteomyelitis. Lots of times we're going back to that. Diabetic population again, non-healing wounds, turns into these ugly things. Traumas, you hear about that. The last 10 years especially, combat, doing a lot more work with the veterans. Blessing and a curse to that though, because the way our government works, if it's good enough for a soldier, it's good enough for a Medicare recipient. So it's unlocked a lot of technology for everybody else that prior to the war starting wasn't available. Microprocessor needs especially. That was a huge thing that came into the market for private payers as well as Medicare because we were giving it to our service guys. War drives technology. If you paid attention to history class ever, you'll learn <laughs> that most of what we got in technology happened because we were trying to blow somebody else up. It sucks, <laughs> but at least something good comes out of it. We are no different in OMP. Matter of fact, Hanger started because the guy who, who came up with the company lost his leg in the Civil War. 
literally day three, he's on the battlefield. James Edward Hanger gets hit by a cannonball. Boom, loses his leg. Doc says, here's your new one. Here's a lump of wood. Go knock yourself out. And he says, this thing sucks. I want to make a better one. So he patents the first articulated knee joint. 151 years later, I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I was talking about. That's his first shot. And that's an interesting change from OMP2 is because it was very much a shot. It wasn't a clinical discipline. We started off much like dentistry did. It was a trade. Dentists were tradespeople. They worked with wood and nails and stuff. They made teeth. It's a trade skill. Now it's a clinical discipline. OMP is the same thing. More guys running doing fun stuff. And you can kind of see the, the progression. It's like, you know, that chart of the man coming out of the water. It's like, here we are with the legs, where <laughs> you, know, you start off with the gift stick that he was given in the Civil War, and then you move up to the articulating joint, the leather and wood, you get into some of the metals now. Now you get into the modern thermoplastics and combinations, and just, it, it just keeps going over. You should get stuff on catalog. How wild is that? <laughs> Frank Schwartz Peak Services, that. Go get your whale chair, you get your bed, you get your leg all in the same place. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> uh, okay, I didn't put that in. When you did that to me, I thought it was out. So today, it's all about the material. Space age, military, DARPA. Does everybody know what DARPA is? All right, basically, it's a government-funded program to create technology. Right? Government says and it, it comes from the defense spending. Right? We want new ways to do stuff. If you think you have a way to do it, we'll give you a buttload of money to figure it out or waste it. They don't care. Sometimes they figure stuff out. <laughs> and carbon fiber, huge. Use it all the time. It's in everything. It's in our cars. It's everywhere now. You can't do anything without it. Our whole industry lives on it. Aluminum, titanium, some of the more exotic stuff that's out there now. Like some of the magnesium and everything that we get into for the athletes. Really cool components, government funding, government spending, NASA, space program, thank the shuttle for those legs. Uh, NBC4 is gone. He walks up and he hits his legs and he says, yep, from NASA. Well, yeah, that's exactly where it came from. So with the prosthesis, we have a lot to consider uh, about how we're going to to deal with the forces around the limb. There's a lot of stuff to look at based on how the patient moves, what their strength is, what their goals are, how we want to help them move, and we got to consider those forces all the time. Because of the forces that are inside of a socket, we need to be very, very careful with how we fit the socket. In the old days, we used to do something called a patellar tendon bearing socket. Anybody do an OMP class yet? Right. Patel, patellar tendon bearing socket, sound familiar? Yeah, we don't do those anymore. They're no good because what they did was they create force in a very specific spot, which, you know, back then sounded like a good idea. The patellar tendon can bear a lot of weight. The calf musculature can bear a lot of weight. Let's squeeze the snot out of those and have the person walk on that. Well, we also thought the world was flat. I think it's not all good ideas. Um, so what we developed over the years is we said, well, we got this whole leg. Why do we want to put force in two spots? It doesn't make sense. Let's use the whole leg. So there's a big move towards total surface bearing. And one of the things that's helped us do that more efficiently is laser technology, where we're using a laser digital scanner to scan the limbs in three dimensions. No more wrapping with plaster, no more wrapping with fiberglass. We use a laser. We've been doing this since actually 2006. And it's incredibly, incredibly effective. Um, it's changed the way we do OMP, and it's allowed us to do what we call this total surface bearing. I don't know if that word ever came up, total surface bearing socket. That's what allows us to do this effectively. Before laser scanning, it was a theory. I'd say, I want to bear weight totally on the surface of this limb. So I'm going to go take a plaster cast by hand. I'm going to modify it by hand. I'm going to make all these awesome mistakes. I'm going to say it's a little surface bearing. Yeah. Now it is. And because of that, and because of what we can do in computer design now, where in the past we would pour the socket, excuse me, we take a cast, pour it with plaster, we would dry. Strip the bandages off, have this plaster thing. Now we get our Leonardo da Vinci on, and we go in there and we carve away, and we add plaster, and we do all this artsy fartsy stuff to create the shape of the socket. Well, now we do it in CAD CAM, and we're exact, we're precise, less than a millimeter of accuracy. And what that's allowed us to do is move into some of these higher tech systems with elevated vacuum. 
We would always hold the legs on with some sort of a keep it center on. Some sort of mechanical system in the past, whether it was a sleeve that grabs onto the thigh or really far back, joints and a corset that would suck onto the limb and hold the thing on. We now use suction where we're taking advantage of this total surface bearing and we put the pressure as evenly as we can and we can create and maintain through the use of microprocessors the elevated level of vacuum inside the leg. And we can tailor it for specifically what the person is doing. Are they just sitting at a desk? Are they going to run with it? Are they sitting on an airplane? Think about that. The airplane's really pressurized to what, 8,000 feet? Now you get this leg on that's just kind of at a different pressure. Well, that could hurt <laughs> a lot when the pressure changes in the cabin. Got to be able to change it. Little tiny things like that that make a huge difference in what an amputee has to deal with every day, and that's what this microprocessor technology can do. Feet, the other cool part of what we do. The technology is moving towards angles. Believe it or not, most prostheses don't have an angle. Technology didn't afford us the opportunity. It was some sort of material compression relaxation in the design of the foot that would allow for what would be considered ankle movement in a normal way. Okay? Where, for example, in this foot, this carbon fiber strut is designed in such a way, and the materials are laid up in the lamination in such a way, that when you land, the heel would compress to get third rocker and kind of replicate that eccentric contraction of the dorsiflexion muscles and allow that foot to slowly get down to the floor. Now we actually have ankle joints. And if they were a little less new and a lot less expensive, I have one here to show you. Um, but they're very cool. We use hydraulics to control ankle motion. So a simple thing for an amputee like walking up a ramp, sounds simple all muscular, our feet change angle. Well, try and do it with something that's stuck perpendicular to the ground. It ain't easy. Try and get up a slope and the whole world goes backwards. Now you can do it with an ankle joint. It sounds simple, but it honestly didn't exist until a couple years ago. We use different materials too. This is a specific example, something from a company called College Park, where they use a system of bumpers and axes to replicate motion in the foot. Great idea. But the wear and tear on these things is brutal. The hydraulics do a much better job at just instead of just having these materials that compress. Another big thing that's happened lately too is upper extremity. For the longest time, there was nothing new in upper extremity. OT, I'm sorry. Boring. We had a hand. Either do like a cylindrical grasp, maybe a three jaw chuck. That's it. That's all we could figure out how to do. It's all people could wear. This stuff gets heavy, man. We start putting actuators and pistons and wires and get a 60 pound arm. Who the hell wants to wear that? So everything's gotten lighter, it's gotten more high tech. To the point now, with again, microprocessors, thanks to the US government, we now have individually, individually opposable fingers. Couldn't do that before. Now we can. Um, it also has proportional control, which means when it comes to myoelectric prosthesis, which uses the conduction velocities felt within the, the muscle, to control the hand movement based on how the person contracts that muscle, it can read the differentials in those velocities and know how much grasp to put in there. Makes the difference between grabbing a wooden dowel and a styrofoam coffee cup. You don't want to grab those with the same pinch force, do you? Things will be bad. So proportional control is a huge, huge development. So, there's a story of the kid, lost his way, got a little high, fell asleep on the train tracks, lost both his legs, lost his arm. Doctors said, you know what, we're going to do a nice wheelchair fitting if you happy as a clam. It turns out, it didn't have to be. Because of the technology we have now, Cameron is actually one of the top athletes in the world on the Paralympics. Uh, circuit. So what I challenge you guys to do is be aware of the other disciplines, whether it's OMP or anything else, and understand what their job is, what their role is going to be in healthcare, and how you're going to interact with those people. But time and time again, I see it every day in practice where everybody's got the blinders on, and I do PT, and I'm the PA, and I'm the nurse, and it's hard to get all the disciplines to come together. And I think there's an opportunity with this new generation of clinicians coming out into the field to change that. We're all in the same boat. Our biggest challenge without question in the year coming years is, is reimbursement. You all want to get paid for what you do. So when we're more efficient at what we do, we communicate better, we get better outcomes. Better outcomes mean we all get paid. Ultimately, it means the patient gets taken care of. And I think it's impossible to do that without everybody 
knowing what each other does. So to that end, I've set some stuff around. I've got some other stuff here to play with. I'd like to open it up to questions, comments, and just, let's just talk about stuff. It's tough because it's, it's a subjective thing. You know, princess and pig. Some people, you guys know that one, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, some people, they could, they could walk on boulders and they would never know the difference. Other people, it's a nice little thing. So it becomes kind of difficult to give you a good answer on that. Um, and it also depends on what you're talking about. You know, if we're doing something simple like a knee immobilizer or a range of motion knee brace for somebody after a, a, a knee replacement, well, the acceptance period to be much, much shorter than for somebody who's going to need to learn how to walk with a hip disarticulation for some years. Because they're going to bear weight in a place God never intended them to bear weight. Uh, there's a lot more to it. And it comes to the skill of the clinician doing things, as well as the, the work of the rehab team around that patient to get them up to the level. So it's, it's a real it's a quality. Really yeah, is there like a gentle amount of time that you have to do that you ask that question. That's my favorite question. Because the concept in general of OMP, and people like to do it, people like to make categories. If A, I get B. If C, I do D. We are 100% custom. It's completely unique to the individual. So there's no, there's absolutely no way to do that. Because so you like could, function, sorry, does function come into play on like function what they want to do versus like yep. even what they're like capable of doing? Correct. And there's, that's where the team approach to the assessment comes into play. I need to know from the therapist what physically this person is capable of now and have a discussion about where we think they can be. As a group, we'll have a discussion about that person's goals. And based on those goals, we'll select different components and design something a different way. Based on cognition, does the patient have the brains to use this stuff? That's important. All those factors will come together to determine what it's going to be. So you can have a general category of a device, say for prosthetics, it's going to be a transcendental prosthesis, probably have some kind of ankle foot, but to get into the specifics, you really got to know the person and have a group discussion about it. I could bring 10 post-polio patients in here with exactly the same muscle function test. You, know, you can do range of motion and muscle testing, and all 10 will fit, be the same, all 10 braces will look different. That's why I'm jacked. There's one of the questions that Becca was asking, uh, Joel, Yeah, I think I think we're there to an extent because some of the stuff that we're able to do with prehension has come light years, maybe in the last five years of world. I think the answer to your question is dependent on the person. Their acceptance of technology and their ability to learn and the drive to learn something new. Um, it's difficult to use a myoelectric prosthesis. It's real tough because you're asking the person with their mind to use something in a way they've never had to do before. And there's no way for them to gauge what that thing you're instructing them to do means. So from an OT standpoint, I'm gonna tell somebody to come and, and, and steal Jess's wallet. So well, what's it gonna to take to do that? Well, okay, to close the hand, you need to have a 20% contraction of your flexicarpal radialis. What the hell does that mean to somebody you're trained? It's tough to do, but people figure it out if they're invested in it and they want to do it. Whereas with the body power, they got the cables and they're using the, the protraction and retraction and you've got this mechanical thing to happen. There's a lot more feedback because you can feel, as an APT, the pressure of the hooks by using the cables. There's a more direct feedback that way so somebody understands what the pressure means that they're putting to swipe their wallet. So I'd say it, it really depends on the, the driving person, the skill of the clinician involved, both on the rehab and OT uh, side. And, um, Uh, I've been going to therapy for over 30 years. I started in the VA, John and I were together. Um, and there, of course, we got the veterans, but we saw a lot of diabetic wounds, a lot of cardiovascular disease wounds, and amputations of some, 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 some amputations. 
since I would say in the last six or seven years with the advancement in wounding products and treatments, I don't see the gaming patients like that. Is that something that perhaps I'm working with a different group now, or is it pretty true that you've been more so? Um, the, the, the number of amputations are rising every year. And I think what you're seeing is the group of people who've been able to get to the care that can solve the problem because that level of care has improved dramatically. But at the same time, America as a whole is doing a much worse job of taking care of themselves. And a lot of people just don't get to that kind of care that can help you them avoid the wounds and the amputations. Yeah. And then there's less smoking, the diabetics are increasing. The, the obesity rate in this country is, is why I make a living. It, it honestly is. If, you, if we solved obesity tomorrow, I'd be strumming a banjo on the corner trying to put coin in a case because <laughs> it, it really drives our industry. Sad as it is, I mean, living off of overweight, unhealthy people. Sorry. Um, speaking of obesity, again, prosthetic like that, I've had that for a Um, not anymore, but there used to be. It's interesting uh, when you look at it this way. In 1998, when I first started seeing patients, the weight limit across the industry was 170 pounds for almost everybody. Think about it. And that fit almost everybody in 1998. That worked. Every now and then, you get somebody who couldn't use an off-the-shelf foot at 170 pounds. They were the oddity. By 2000, that weight limit went up to 225, and we rejoiced. We're like, yay, thank God. Because we didn't have the one-off custom make feet as much. Now the average weight limit is 325. Because that's what this country has forced us to do. I can tell you they do not sell 325 pound feet in Europe. They just don't. Autobach, the company that makes most of the feet in our industry, <laughs> thought we were crazy in the early 2000s when we went to them and said we need to put it below 3 pounds. They're like, no, 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 we don't do elephants. <laughs> so as an industry, we had a little problem in the U.S. kind of catching up with that because of the weight stuff. Um, so yes, the material selection is very, very important. We have that's the engineering background of, of what we do in OP comes in because we need to understand. All right, first of all, how much does this person weigh? Static weight through the prosthesis. How much can these materials stand? Now we're going to add inertial mass to move. Then we're going to figure out well, how are they moving? Are they walking? Are they running? Um, I got a guy who's a lumberjack, he jumps. Sometimes with 40, 50, 60 pounds of stuff in his arm. Boom, off his tail again. Um, if I could load up a picture from my iPhone, I'd show you. He managed to <coughs> snap a pile on the other day, um, which was rated for over 500 pounds. So you got to consider what else these people are trying to do. <laughs> So what I can do is this, to start my answer to you with the definition. Right? The definition of a prosthetist or orthotist is a person who evaluates people for and then fits them to orthotic prosthetic devices. So as a clinician, my job is patient interaction. Um, from that patient interaction, when we step out of the clinical room with the patient and we move to the kind of back room where we make adjustments or fabricate, I then dictate to our technicians who do the actual fabrication, all right, here's my specs. Based on my evaluation, what I think this person is going to do. This is the type of socket I want. This is the layup for the carbon lamination. This is how we want it done. Um, with the exception of these hard components here and the prosthetic feet, we're making the rest custom for the person. This stuff we buy, but it's based on that weight and activity level. They put these into force categories. Again, based on how the carbon is laid up and the way it's shaped and everything, it'll create a certain type of function. Um, so some of that stuff, we say, all right, I'm going to pick that for this patient. I'll have it brought into the lab. Meanwhile, the guys in the back fabricating this laminated part, custom to a model that I've made, and then they'll do the final assembly, and then I'll, I'll 
take in the room and say, all right, Mr. So-and-so, how's this fit? How's it look? Let's have you walk. Let's see what the pressures are on the socket. How's your skin look? Is everything aligned properly? Is it working the right way? I'll make these adjustments. Um, to an extent, I'll make some of the technical adjustments in the back. We're trained. We're trained to do all of it. But because healthcare is what it is, it's not cost effective for me to do it. So that's why I hand off to a technician to actually do the fabrication. Those technicians would take you there. So, yeah, it's a trade school, just like ITT Tech or whatever that is. So, you know, it's a six month program to learn whatever trade you want to learn. Most of the schools now combine orthotic and prosthetic technician work. It used to be in the past that you would pick one or the other. But now it's a six month, you learn both type program, become a certified technician. Um, not to say we don't grab people from other fields to do the work, because a lot of this stuff crosses over to aerospace. Um, for some of the cosmetic restoration stuff we do with like silicone replacements, fingers and noses and ears and stuff, we actually have a couple of people working up in our fabrication facility, Crom Mill, who used to work in Hollywood, um, making movie makeup and masks. Uh, one of the guys who's a student, actually, a first year student this year, used to work for SNL. He did all the makeup before they did the skits and stuff. So you kind of you can kind of cherry pick from different industries and bring people in because uh, this stuff does cross around. Yeah, I have a question because I automated boxes and I Swim legs all the time. Uh, the key with a swim leg is you got to make sure the components you pick are not going to oxidize uh, or drag the person to the bottom. Um, so designing stuff that's going to be neutrally buoyant uh, can be a little tricky because of during fresh water versus salt water changes. Uh, so depending on what the person's going to do, you can really, really tailor the device to their specific needs. Most people get away with the device that's mostly plastic. So a very simple foot, usually you can get to and from. Pool, to the ocean, something like that. Real static, not very dynamic at all. More than anything, it's just not going to rust out for you. Cosmetically, what kind of <sighs> Cosmetics becomes an issue of finances. Okay. It can look as pretty as you can afford. Let's put it that way. Um, and put that kind of money, because you're talking five, six thousand dollars yeah. to really make it really nice. You can do a swim leg, doesn't make a lot of sense. So for the swim legs, no, they're pure function. Uh, you know, is this person just looking to get stacked into the water so it's going to be real stiff and the foot's not going to move? The people who say are scuba diving, right? I mean, they're on the boat deck, they got to be able to get on the boat deck, but then when they hop in the water, they got to kick their fins, so we'll have an adjusted position of the foot that the industry's come out with due to change the component. Autobach, as a specific example, has come up with their Aqualine. Aqualine components, <laughs> which are salt water rated, so you can use them in a salt environment. The only thing you have to rinse them off, put them in a little silicone every now and then, and they'll last long. Wherever they're going to the water, or is it to help provide them balance, it can, like within the ground? Yeah, it could be either one. Because, uh, like I was saying, some people just want to get to the water, and then once they get in, they just kind of bob around looking for it, and life is good. And there's other people who are active and they purposely want to swim, triathletes, scuba divers, you know, stuff like that, where they really need to do something once they're in the water. Then we would design a prosthesis that could maybe do both. Whereas some people just say, listen, all I care is I got to be able to kick. Plot myself on the side of the boat. I don't care to walk around. I want it to kick really well. Because every time you try to make a prosthesis do one thing, generally you give up on something else. It's kind of that whole you can either create or destroy matter, you can either you know, create or destroy the perfect land. You, you give and you get. Uh, so it's all about kind of weighing those sacrifices from each thing and to figure out what's right for the person. In terms of like uh, recreational activities, like would you use the function? What would you Usually nothing. <laughs> yeah. Medical necessity. It's all about medical necessity. Is it medically necessary to do whatever? And um, I can tell you on a daily basis, I get requests from insurance companies wanting me to explain to them why a person who's missing a leg needs a leg. It's almost so simple you don't even know how to answer it. So to then go to the next step and say, well, not only do they want a leg so they can walk around their house and go to work and you know, go to the bathroom and do all this stuff, well, they like to play with their kids in the yard, so we want an activity leg. Good luck with that. So the only time usually that stuff would be reimbursable through uh, some sort of payer source would be like workers' comp. 
uh, where they've sued for it <laughs> and, and they can get it. Uh, it's usually an out-of-pocket expense. Sometimes we can help out with that a little bit. We'll you know, do some fundraising and that sort of thing, but insurance companies these days, you're lucky you get a, an ambulatory prosthesis little more especially. Sorry. Does work work cost on out It depends on the suit. You know, guy had a good lawyer. Case can stay open for a while. Eventually, they'll close it. But when they close it, there's usually some kind of payout that helps them the rest of the way. So it depends. You know, some people, quite frankly, get screwed because uh, that's what lawyers do. They're the law school lawyers, right? Go ask them. <laughs> uh, and other people, they get a good settlement. And they get stuff taken care of. Uh, I got a fella. Um, he worked for Blackwater. He was. You guys know what Blackwater is? Okay. Uh, private military company. They were a contractor for the U.S. government over in Iraq and Afghanistan. Hired at about $150,000 a year to do the same job our Marines do for about 22. Do the math. And what they would do while they were over there was all kinds of different stuff, whether it was interdiction, uh, mine removal. So what this fellow did, which was train the police force, he was an army. So he left the Marines, joined Blackwater, and his job was to teach uh, the Afghan police how to be police. Order. And they were just driving to and from one day in unarmored vehicles, it was Nissan pickups, and they hit 90. Lost both his legs in the 90. Um, because of the deal Blackwater cut with the US government, he's taken care of for life. So no matter what he wants, whether it's for running, swimming, polo, whatever, he's covered from here on out. Uh, it's just the way it goes. Is that true for service connected death? Nope. <laughs> no. The U.S. government pays the private military contractors significantly better benefits than our soldiers. That's the Bush administration. <laughs> I'm a Republican, so I'm not going to hear this up, but yeah, that was the Bushes when they made the deal with um, Jimmy's guy there. And so forth. But anyway, yeah, they have way better benefits. Than so. You guys have to really appreciate that, too. You know, we talk a little bit about it. realize you guys have to be the advocate for the patient. Insurance companies can't continue to get away with what they do. Of denying people basic services like medical. Yeah. Um, it, it's got to come from it's got to come from the grassroots. It's got to come up, especially from healthcare providers. Because uh, it, it's awful what they've done. And the only time you see advancement in R and D is is Joe is saying that. You see it in that population goes away, how many people get hurt? It's not a lot. How much R&D is our robot going to do when they can only sell so many and there's not a big demand for it? So R&D goes right down the tubes and then you stay really stagnant for a long time. I think yeah. we've seen that most of the time. We saw that uh, fix program added things and yep. we're seeing a big burst right now. People always ask, wow, why does that cost so much? That leg I was passing around, it's fiberglass right now because we're doing a fitting, it's not finished yet. Um, $15,000. And you're going to sit there and go, whoa, $15,000, geez, that's a lot of money. Well, when you consider maybe Autobach maybe gets to sell 200 of those a year, you know, if you only sell 200 Ford Escapes, how much would that cost? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's you know, the reason they only cost $30,000 because they sell 200,000 of them. Um, it's a numbers game. And, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, and just like you were saying, the reason we've got all this amazing technology, the reason that pump exists is because of the war. That technology wouldn't exist if governments weren't pumping money into paying for stuff because the public's looking at how well the soldiers are taken care of. As soon as it's over, and they stop looking, it, we're going to flatten out again just like we did when I first got into the business. We had the same technology for like five, six years. Nothing changed. And all of a sudden, bam started happening. So I take probably an hour every day and sit down at my desk and write letters to insurance companies and um, even to educate doctors because you'd be surprised how many doctors have no idea what prosthetics or products they are. 
and I have to explain to everybody involved how to advocate for their patients, how to get them this stuff. I mean, my God, Blue Cross asked me why a guy was no leg and delay. And more than once, we get that question all the time. Think about that. He almost can't answer it. It's like, because well, he doesn't have one for crying out loud. Like, <laughs> duh. You know? How would you feel if you never left? But you can't, it doesn't work that way. So, yeah, you got to fight for people. You really do these days. It's a sad state of affairs. And, and it's absolutely true, and it's going to happen in every type of functional care system that you need to get for a patient. And you need to be compassionate towards your patients. I just had a client with a post polio syndrome child with, who's got lung cancer who needs a car, car wheelchair. It was writing letter after letter after letter. Having a physician was wonderful. Wrote three letters. We all fought for her. She lived in a place that the residential care person wrote for her. They denied it three times. She finally appealed and on the appeal they approved it. There was, there was functional reason for her to have that wheelchair. The way the budget is, Medicare is not just going to say, yep, you're fine, you're good. You're going to have to really advocate. It doesn't happen that often. I don't spend that kind of time and effort on every single one of my patients. But you're going to run into that. And you're going to be the person, if you work hard, who's going to allow that patient to get that leg, to be able to drive, to go to see family, to be active. So don't give up on your patients. Keep fighting for them. Eventually, if you're really fortunate and you really work hard, you'll get what that patient needs. And kind of while we're on a downer right now, um, <laughs> <laughs> the, it, it's, it's tough because right now there's an interesting thing happening. There's no money, right? There's no money for anything. And Medicare's running out of money. The states doesn't have enough money. Nobody's got money. So what they've done is they've slowed down my ability to fix it. Right? Medicaid, great example. The state of Connecticut says, here's a list of things that we pay for, no questions asked. Except for this question right here, which is, why do they need it? It's called an authorization process. It didn't exist before. Every amputee now who's going to get a leg has to go through this authorization process. So in the past, I'd see John Smith today, do a fitting next week, and have the leg done the week after, and you as therapists who only have so many days to work with a patient are happy to plan because now you can do all this skilled therapy with them. Yeah, well now, because my process slowed down, now it's maybe two weeks, or three weeks, or four weeks. And I haven't gotten an answer as to whether it can even start the way. Meanwhile, you guys are calling me on the phone every day, hey, Jerk, I'm waiting over here. I gotta go see this patient, I'm running out of days. I can't do anything about it. So the therapy gets wasted, and by the time the person gets the leg, they're out of therapy and learn how to use it. And it's really creating quite a conundrum in, in healthcare right now. And it all really started back in April. Uh, so it's kind of a new thing where we're sort of working our way through. We're hoping through communication with different therapists and different kind of different folks what we do, we can sort of figure this out. Uh, you know, a lot of these rehab companies don't like the therapists to go back to them and say, hey, listen, I'm not going to see John Smith for two weeks because I need to wait for his leg. And they're going, oh, no, no, we need to bill for two weeks or you don't get paycheck. So everybody's getting pulled in a couple directions. And it's, it's a very, very tough climate right now. Very tough. But it's doable. We had actually thought of that uh, a couple years ago. Hanger, Hanger as a company is, is Hanger, and it has all these different branches. Hanger Clinic is one of them. Innovative Neurotronics makes different electronic devices. Uh, Southern Prosthetic Supply supplies us with a bunch of stuff. So we have all these different business units, and one of them we were thinking about was opening up our own branch of physical therapy. So we went to the government and said, hey, government, this is our bright idea. And they went, yeah, no, you can't do that. Uh, one, they say it's a conflict of interest because your own therapist will be sending you patients and you'll be sending patients to your own therapist and they don't like that. It's kind of defeats this whole competitive uh, bidding thing that they're all so hung up on. Uh, and the other part of it too is when you say, all right, well, they've got this thing, if we had our own physical therapy branch and we could, even if we didn't bill for it all the time, at least we have therapists on staff that can teach them stuff. So then Medicare piped up and says, well, well, if you can do it for free then, why can't you do it for free all the time? And for that reason alone, we shot the idea. As far as therapy goes, like how much of a plan do you have in your patients' physical therapy or occupational therapy? Like, do you have suggestions for therapists, or like, how does that work? More
more times than not, yes. Um, most of the therapists I deal with have never seen an amputation before. I haven't worked with an amputee. Um, so really, it's, it's, it's me understanding how to speak PT and them understanding where I'm coming from to be able to say, all right, what do you want to work on as a therapist? Well, we want to do this gait and you know, we want to work on strength this and do that. I said, all right, well, with the prosthesis, this is how a person can perform those tasks. So together, we kind of say, all right, this is how the routine would go. I say, well, in order for him to, to be able to say for, for a, an above knee prosthesis, it's a great example. Because when the person loses their knee joint, it's actually their hip musculature that controls the knee. So when they go to take a step and their heel hits the ground, it's because they can hyperextend their hips, and to a certain degree, they can hyperextend range of motion wise, that they're able to lock the knee and stand on it in their weight. So we'll sit down and say, all right, well, John Smith, he's going to use this uh, AK. Well, from a prosthetic standpoint, I got to be able to see five degrees of extension. And I got to be able to see strength of you know, three out of five at least. Kind of start there. And then they say, all right, well, now he's up and walking. What am I looking for? So like, well, let's go get the Perry Gate book out. And start talking Perry Gate because that's what you want to achieve. Um, previous to the last five or seven years, amputee gate was different than Perry Gate. They weren't the same because the technology didn't allow you to do certain things. You couldn't do third rocker with an above knee prosthesis. You had to hip height, circum duct, trunk lean, whatever, because a knee unit wouldn't fully unlock unless it was totally off the ground. But now, and I think this is where it's going to become easier as therapists because it's closer to training for normal gait, because of the way the hydraulics are designed, because of the knee unit set up, because we're using microprocessors, a person can get the toe off, and the knee knows it's time to let go. And they can swing their leg underneath them, which five years ago, sounds simple enough, but it's groundbreaking when you talk about that impact on a person's energy expenditure, wear and tear on the joint, all the other effects that come with that kind of funky gait style, and the shape of muscles, you know, I mean, it's crazy the way we force the MVPs to walk because of the technology we have. Um, we've talked about K levels in our class, and I don't know if it's just being a PT, like I want to get my patient to an optimal level. Do you feel like because of the K levels that are set that you're restricted, given all this new technology, you're restricted to a certain prosthetic that you can give those people to get covered? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, so there's something called the RAC audit. It's the Recovery Audit Commission. And the government kind of took a step back and said, all right, we don't have any money. We want some back. So we're going to look at all the stuff you've provided over the last 11 years, but we're going to apply this year's rules. And you know, isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? So they can look at a claim from whatever, 2009, and say, oh, I didn't follow 2013's rules. Like, no, duh, it wasn't 2009. <laughs> but we want our money back. And the thing they're harping on the most is does the components we've selected match the K-level? That's the thing they're hanging their hat on. So in the past, we might have been a little more willy-nilly with what we thought somebody's K-level was. The and a K-level, for you, <laughs> those of you who haven't done it, is just like a functional level. So like a ultimate like community walker, and unlimited, walk versus who's just, just going versus in a house. Just a transfer, or somebody who's just going to be a wheelchair would be a K-0. Um, that functional level says, all right, well, based on what they're going to do, they can have these components. Makes sense. It doesn't make sense to put a you know, high-end running knee on you know, an 88-year-old ditty who's just going to kind of hang up and throw a check. <laughs> <laughs> but what the rack one is doing <coughs> is it's really, really locking in on that. So like I said, we're a little willy-nilly about it. We said, well, you know what? The, the, the way it's, the K-level thing is written is it's the patient currently has the ability to or the potential to ambulate at a K whatever level. And with that, we'd say, well, he doesn't have a leg right now. We're kind of pumping at where we think he's going to go based on what he did before he had the amputation, how he presents now, what his comorbidities are. And, and we're going to say, you know what? Theoretically, he's a K0 right now. He's got a leg. But we think he's going to be a K3 because he was a real active, healthy guy before. And now they're coming back and saying, yeah, he's not active there's no real definition for it. Um, so in the current climate, I think clinicians in general are a little more reticent 
to use technology that they might have used last year at this time. I'm fortunate at Hangar, because we're the big dog, that I don't have to think that way. Because if I make a decision, I know I'm making the right decision. There's a lot of nimics out there who are going to try and build that same old biddy who sits and crochets for a $50,000 sea leg. And those are the guys that created this process, this problem. But I know I'm doing the right thing. And if the rat comes a knocking and they say, hey, we don't like your K level, well, Hanger's going to fight it. So I have comfort knowing that I can do what I think is right for my patients all the time. But we're probably going to have to fight for it. Luckily, Hanger, to your own horn, we're like 90%, 96% of the time we, we win our rat fights. Rat rat and they probably do it. I think the industry right now is averaging about 45%. So there's a lot of guys out there who are just afraid to do stuff with patients because they suck it up and get paid. And when you don't get reimbursed or you have to give money back, well, it makes it hard to have the money to see the next patient. Um, like I said, we're big dogs. So I, Yeah, the rack audits are putting people out of business. So in an industry where we're already shorthanded, uh, the government's shutting people down. Yep, absolutely. So what should I do with this wedding? <laughs> how many copies? <laughs> 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 how many copies good? How many copies bad? Somebody's got to count. Um, it's tough. I don't know. I don't know what anybody's going to see when you get out there. Who knows? I mean, when I, when I got done here at Country Back in 97, it was like the dark ages. A little thing called PPS, um, yeah, PPS came along, respective payment system, and everybody in the nursing homes literally overnight turned their pockets inside out. They just went, oh crap, we're done. And you know, Trinidad was pumping out students, man. There were PTs hitting the market. This place was just drumming them out like an assembly line. And they'd walk out the door and they're like, yep, I'm a graduate, I'm a good PPS, and I'm a good PT. And the only job they could get was a Fridays. Because the market just, boom, tanked because of PPS. Then everybody figured out how to work with PPS. They learned the rules. They learned the vendor rules. And now there's been a resurgence in the quality of the jobs that are out there for therapists and, and people hitting the marketplace. O&P is unique in that there are so few of us. I think last year they graduated 170 people in the entire country. How many <laughs> people are in your graduating class? 80. All right? That's just good. Okay. I mean, Hartford is a lot of places. So as long as you're mobile and you don't have your heart set on being someplace like Connecticut, then you'll find a job anywhere in OP. It's just tough in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Florida because of their schools. And everybody tends to finish school and kind of not move too far. <laughs> um, so the market here for jobs is super competitive. Um, helps to know somebody. <laughs> so, <laughs> my dad always said it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, but I think it's it's interesting. All right, remember this. There's always going to be a guy at the top of the heap who's always going to put money in his pocket. So it behooves him to always figure out how to put money in his pocket. And what you need to do, regardless of your discipline, is figure out where you can comfortably fit in that scale. Where's your happy place? What can you do for a living? What can you do to get up out of bed every morning and be happy about what you're doing, but still make a living? Because somebody's always going to figure out. People are always going to need to be taken care of. More than ever. Baby boomers are hitting healthcare like a sledgehammer. They're coming out of the woodwork. Um, it's their time, man. There's going to be a lot of people to take care of over the next 20 years. Unfortunately, not a lot of money to do it. It's a very, very unique problem in healthcare. And we've got more patients than ever, but less money than ever to take care of. Somebody's going to figure out a way. Um, be flexible, be smart, watch what the market's doing, don't put your blinders on and just go to work every day. Be aware, be involved, be involved with your professional organization, the ABTA and the, the uh, not condo, that's the lead of the, I'm sorry, I should know this. Get involved with those organizations. <laughs> get involved with the organizations and be a part of fixing the problem, because if you just think you're going to punch in and punch out every day, you're wrong. You're going to have to do something more to make sure you have a job. Um, but it's not that bleak. I mean, I bought two Porsches last night. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm a pauper. I do great. It's good money. You guys are going to make great money when you get out. It's going to happen. Um, but it's going to be harder to do it. Right? I mean, there were days, gosh, man, I remember some of my friends. 
I have been my 12 patients day, I'm literally sweating, I've got you know, half the day to go, and I get a phone call, hey dude, we're gonna go play golf. <laughs> I'm like, what? Like, yeah, I don't have a patient again until four. But they're making 90 grand a year because they can afford to see four patients a day and make a killing. Well, you can't go like you used to. So, you know, my friends aren't playing golf in the middle of the week like they used to. But they're still making a living. They're still happy doing it. I have one question. I know this summer I was in Wisconsin at Cancer Versus Singer. Um, but it was To be perfectly honest, it all depends on the quality of the clinician you're working with. I would never in a million years do that to somebody, patient or referral. Okay. You needed me, I'd find a way to get there. Two and a half weeks is unacceptable. Um, but in any industry, there's people who are good at their job and there's people who are bad at their job. So without trashing whoever you work with, I would have never done that. If you called me up and say, listen, I know you just saw her, we're still having trouble. When can you come back? I'm not, gonna, ah, I'm not due to be back there in two and a half weeks. You're just, no, I'd come up or I'd find somebody who can. A uh, hanger especially, that disappoints me because we've got resources up in you. You know, I can always call another office and say, listen, I'm sick today. Joe's, I don't know, doped up somewhere, who knows. I can't, you can't, <laughs> let me call Blader Waterbury and have them come and help you out or something like that. Um, push. And if you find you're pushing and you're not happy, go somewhere else. Find another person. Yeah, I think what uh, Joe's profession is really important. And it's getting involved in Join the APTA, you're going to get you're going to get beat up all the time by other people who are going to lobby stronger for their causes. And our professor, our professional associations are taking care of it. They are watching. Joe's association is watching the process and working. Um, nurses association are watching what they do, and it's important because unless you do that, you get taken advantage. You know who beats us up the most? And I'll say it. I'll say this many times as I want. Physicians are beating us up. They are owning physical therapy companies. They should not own physical therapy companies. They have no right or it's like owning a pharmacy. Self-referral for profit. They need to go away. And our association wants them to go away badly. And I, I don't want any company ever have to ever work for a physician on practice and pay a flat out. And uh, I know some of you will because they're going to offer you an extra $20,000. than OPM. We account for less than 1% of healthcare dollars spent. Do you think anybody in government gets a damn what we say? No. And when it comes to lobbying bodies, well, like I said, there's, uh, I think, in total in the United States, 7,000 OT practitioners. I think there's that many PTs in Connecticut. Uh, so in the whole country, there's only 7,000 of us. So when we all get together and we, we try and lobby, you know, it's kind of So who's going to lobby for PMOs? It's, it's us as healthcare providers oh. lobbying for our patients. That's who we have to lobby for. Lobby for our patients, and we say that an important component of our patients is PO, then they will get what they deserve. Because right now their numbers are. Yeah, they don't have the numbers to fight. And it actually an interesting story, too, talking about doctors. They, doctors developed this thing called a closet. And what they can do is they can do a box of prosthetics. Right? Mm -hmm. And when they build this out of a closet, 
they can use the same billing codes I use, but not provide the same level of service. We're going to have to mind around this. When I fit somebody to, say, a TLSO, okay, thermoplastic race, designers hold the spine slope, for whatever reason, I don't get the bill for my time. All right? Our fee schedule was designed at the time when walkers and wheelchairs were part of what we do, DME, for medical bill. Wheelchairs don't bill for time. So subsequently, as we've developed into a clinical discipline, we're stuck with this fee schedule. So the government says, well, make it fair. We'll adjust the pricing to include some kind of time. So whether I see somebody once or I see them a thousand times, I get paid a certain fee. And within that fee, it's expected that not only do I provide the thing, but I provide a certain level of care to go with the thing for a certain amount of time. Doctors, with their closets, can build that same code, let their hands in. So if John Smith gets a back brace out of Dr. Butts' Butts' closet, and the next morning he wakes up, he's like, that's killing me, it's poking and jabbing me right here. Hey, Doc, what a brace hurts. He doesn't have to adjust it. He doesn't have to make any changes. He doesn't have to work with it at all. He made his money that way. And the rules are different because they can lobby better than we can. That's what happens. Matter of fact, I had a doctor who was so ballsy. <laughs> he opened up his own closet. He not only called me up one time to ask me how to build for something, but he also said, hey, I put this guy to a brace and it's driving him crazy. Can I send him over to you so you can adjust it? <laughs> and I said, no, no, you cannot. I am not doing it. I'm sorry. I didn't fit the brace. I have no ownership of the brace. You decide you want to do bracing, well, then you need to do bracing. Whatever that means, you got to do it. Anyway, fun stuff. <laughs> reality is there are sick people who need our service. The nursing homes are closing up, but the government is providing the care in the home. So the work is still there. It's just not in the same facilities. PT has changed tremendously in 30-something years. Even in the last 10 years, the, the curve has been on. Huge change. And you have to kind of say, OK, what do I want to do? Where do I want to practice? What do I want to uh, concentrate on? And then you find the environment you want to be in. Nursing homes are closing. Home care is taking over. I love it. <laughs> I, I, I love going in the home, fighting for my patients, although I don't like the time it can take. The relationships you build, it's so much better than a nursing home. And for the clients, it's better. Who wants to be in a nursing home? So the government is not completely abandoning the patients. There's still needs and there's still work for you to do. So I just didn't want you to feel like, oh my God, I'm gonna really find a job. You know, <laughs> the reality is when I graduated, uh, I lived an hour away from here and I wanted to stay home, but there were no jobs. So Denise called, hey, there's a job in the VA. So that, you know, so I'm here, you know. Um, and that's what you're probably going to face. You know, it's like, oh, you know what? There's a job out over in the land estate. And just so on and so forth. But, you know, there's still, there's still uh, rewarding work um, that you should feel proud to do when you graduate. Yeah, I think it, it's different, too, because... You know, if you go back to when I first got into it, it was kind of the very end of the heyday of healthcare. And people were just billing their pants off for virtually nothing. And the amount of effort that went into the amount of dollar received was so much more different back in the late 90s than it is now. I think the old salts that have been at it for a while can see that differential and it hurts. Uh, you guys know there's a difference. It's always going to be this way for you guys. You really know because it's your world. Uh, and the best advice I can give you is. Um, you're entitled to nothing in life, in general, right? Nobody owes you a damn thing, whether it comes to work, your home life, the car, nobody owes you squat. The only reason in life you're ever gonna get anything is because you went out and got it. So when healthcare turns and things get strange, the only reason you're gonna keep working is because you went out and did it, not because you graduated from cutting edge, right? So I think that's important lesson for life in general that I see lacking in a lot of people. Yeah. How many people, uh, raise me up, if you're uh, in the uh, PT group, 
Graduate Club office. I want to thank you guys very much for putting uh, this together. I want, to, I want to thank Lou very much for coming and spending his time with us. Uh, Lou, appreciate it. Uh, before you guys leave, if you are a, I guess we're first or second year students, and you are interested in getting involved with the e-board, um, please come talk to me at the end of this. Um, just if you have an inkling that you want to get involved, just come talk.